This is part two of our lecture on the 1863 French art salons and how they led to the Impressionist group we know today. The Edward Manet Luncheon on the Grass, Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe, was the talk of the town in the cause salab. Because of its harsh treatment by the jury and the press, it planted the seeds of the breakaway Impressionist show that was to come. So what is it about this work? What so enrages viewers? It's a strange scene. The woman is staring at us naked, but the men are in formal dress. Now that is strange, but the criticism went beyond that peculiar composition. She is not idealized. Look at her. She has chalky skin. She doesn't have what many consider to be a voluptuous, desirable model's body. She has a little bit of a roll across her stomach. Here, Victorine Moran, Manet's frequent model, is staring at you and making sure, once again, that you are staring right back at her to see that she is naked, sitting there with these two guys dressed to the nines. So this was wildly criticized, in part, because of her nudity. But let's see, where did this work come from, and what's the big deal about the nudity? Well, it seems nudity is allowed as long as it's idealized or it is mythological. So, Manet was known to have studied classical art. You can see that he lifted this scene <coughs> from Venetian high Renaissance painter Giorgione's pastoral concert that you see on the left, where the men are, are dressed and they're having a kind of vision of these mythological nudes joining them at the fountain. On the right, you can see the exact poses that Manet is using. This is a subsection of The Judgment of Paris by Raphael. Raphael collaborated with Raimondi, the printmaker, on the engraving. Raphael's Judgment of Paris painting from which this comes is lost. However, you can still see from whom Manet borrowed. If you're going to steal, of course, steal from the best. He's putting his own modern spin on it. It turns out that this work had too much modernism. Contemporizing the scene was considered too much. Note that Manet does not follow the practice of using chiaroscuro, the softening and blending of edges around the figures. So let me ask, how do these older pieces compare with the Manet. Meanwhile, across the hall, in the big show, they had a regular Salon de Venus going on. So while at the rejected event show, the nude was under scrutiny in the official Salon, there were many nudes to view and they were very well accepted. The Cabanel, Birth of Venus, on the left, and the Paul Baldry nude on the right are two examples. We know the one on the left is a Venus. The one on the right, we don't think that she's really a mythological figure, more so she's just an attractive nude, loosely postured like the Venus, entitled to be one. Mythological or not, she was deemed acceptable by the jury. Before we move into Impressionism, I want to pose the question of how or why do we know about the artist that we know about? This is a fun topic, so we're going to take a minute here. This chart was introduced to me <coughs> by Professor Yude at the School of the Art Institute. It was stuck with me for over a decade now, and I'd like to explore the codependency between these various parts of the art world ecosystem. First, let's ponder, if an artist creates something and no one ever sees it, is it still a work of art? Or does it need to be validated and seen in order to be real? What dynamic was in play during the time of the French Salon? We had an artist, and they were trying to get into curated shows, such as the Salon. Uh, the ex exhibition's jury we could consider that to be the curator on the right here. If an artist's work happened to get into the exhibition, hopefully the people here on the left noticed. 
This is the group of newspaper critics that included some of the most famous writers of all time, including Charles Baudelaire and Emile Zola. There were dozens of papers with articles writing about these shows. So, once the buzz starts, the artists begin to get traction, and that leads to collectors or dealers getting involved. And on you can see how this feeds off itself. In today's culture, we see that we have artists, and we have public relations, and we have dealers promoting them, and hopefully a museum decides to add them to their collection, and each leg of this graphic can help validate the next leg. Major dealers of the later 19th century included Goupil, Boussard, Valadon, Paul Durand Ruel, and Ambroise Voulard. It's been suggested that in today's terms, we might want to look at this chart and see how would we fit social media into this star, or would we have to redraw the visual here to accommodate the effect of social media? In a recent class, before I could even mention it, a student asked, why didn't the rejected artists plan their own shows? Well, the Impressionists did band together to gain visibility, and we know who they are because of the notoriety they earned. Edward Manet, Edward Degas, Bert Morisot, Mary Cassatt were all in a similar social strata and knew one another. In fact, Bert Morisot married Eugene Manet, Edward's brother. At the same time, Pierre Renoir, Claude Monet, Claude Pizarro, and Alfred Cisley were taking classes at Studio Glaire and Académie Julian. Eventually, these two groups merged. The renoir monet grouping really wanted to find a way into Edward Manet's orbit in particular. You can see this on the right, where Henri Fantin Latour did this painting, the studio and the batagnole. Manet, the painter, is the central figure, and alongside him, you have Renoir with the hat, Emile Zola with the glasses, Frederick Bazile is the tall one, and Claude Monet is on the far right edge. Being tall proves to be quite a hazard in those days. Bazile was killed in the short-lived Franco-Prussian War. His death led to the first of the eight Impressionist shows not being held until 1864. As much as the others revered Manet, oddly enough, he did not display with them at their shows. He was a kind of spiritual leader of the group, but on the other hand, he was never part of the exhibiting group, and he did not paint in their style, yet somehow he was still the spiritual patriarch anyway. So, we move on to the original Impressionist show itself. This is it. Ground zero. It all started here. Here is Impression Sunrise by Claude Monet. Quite amazingly, you can stand just a few feet away from this piece at the small Musée Marmiton in Paris. This painting was characterized by critic Louis Leroy in his satirical paper as just impressions, as being unfinished, clumsy, an easy way to finish a painting. It lacks drawing and it's sketchy. Simply, it is not what art is supposed to be. It also uses a lot of color theory, and I point this out because Chevril, the artist who developed color theory, had been a consultant 200 years earlier for the founders of the Académie des Beaux-Arts. Monet was influenced by Eugène Boudin and Charles-François Dubigny. Both these artists, particularly Dubigny, were characterized as being Impressionist in style. Dubigny was associated with the Barbizon School of Artists who painted in the Fountain Blue Forest area just outside of Paris. Boudin's works were small, oil on board, and sold as mementos of a day spent at the Normandy shore. So when you look at these, can you see the roots of Impressionism in these works? This is by Alfred Cisley. He was an Englishman who spent 
his entire life living in France. He was in all eight of the Impressionist shows and is among the only artists who can say that. Some docents feel that you can identify a Cisle from the other Impressionist works by his subtle inclusion of pink in his skies or elsewhere on the canvas. This is by Edward Degas, and it's a painting from the very first show. I know, this isn't what you think of when you think of Degas. It's more rigorously constructed than the ballet dancers, horses, and looser brushstroke nudes that he's known for. In this early Degas, we can see the Japanese influence. What do we see? We note the unusual cropping. The man in the front's legs come right off the frame to join where we are. The diagonal leads into the rear of the room. If this were an outdoor scene, that, that elevated and diminished door would be a higher horizon line. Those are methods which come directly from Japanese prints, which were flooding the artist community the prior decade. Yes. This work on the right is by Paul Cezanne. This is not the Cezanne you think of. This is an early Cezanne, and he's doing a parody of Manet. This is called A Modern Olympia, and you see Olympia by Manet in the lower left. He's riffing on Manet's Olympia from 1865. The Cezanne piece was brutally ridiculed by the press, and he was abused by his friends, too. He obviously stopped working in the style and evolved into the Cezanne we know today, including his precubist shapes of Mount St. Victory and the still lifes we know and adore today. He became an inspiration for Brock and Picasso when they created Cubism, and Cezanne is credited with saying, I paint what I see and not what is there. In that case, he was describing the scene that he saw as he looked out at Mount St. Victory. Renoir's La Loge. Here is Renoir's brother, Edmond Inini, the model. This work was at the first show, but you can begin to see the style that Renoir was developing. This served him very well. He's going to be an example of someone who evolved from being one of the original starving artists to becoming financially well-to-do, largely thanks to lucrative portrait business he cultivated with his rich patrons. He had been a porcelain painter as a teenager, which may explain his wonderful luminescent treatment of eyes and the whites of her gown and jewelry. His use of luscious, slightly atypical colors, in this case it's the pale purple, become an identifying trait of Renoir. Bert Morisot and later Mary Cassatt were considered to be the female members of the Impressionist group. Mademoiselle Bert was well received by others in the group as well as the press and the salon jury, although her more formal arts education started with Jean-Baptiste Camille Corot, one of the great names of all artists, Jean-Baptiste Camille Corot, Edward Manet influenced her greatly. She, of course, ended up marrying Manet's brother, Eugene. Also, interestingly, she posed in several of Manet's most noted paintings and was his second most popular model. I don't know what I was thinking earlier when I said Claude Pizarro. It's Camille Pizarro. And Pizarro was the landscape specialist of the Impressionist who was among the original instigators behind forming a group. He used the Baker's Collective's documents as the basis for creating the anonymous association of artists, sculptors, and printmakers. He was insanely poor for most of his life. Fortunately, he became financially successful in his later years. He was influenced by Corot and Courbet, and he painted with Cezanne quite a bit. He influenced the American early 20th century Ashcan artist, Ernest Lawson, who appears later when we have our American Ashcan Artist Group lecture. 
In closing, just think about what we covered today when we went from the French Academy and the juried salons all the way through to the Impressionist shows. And then think through how that relates to the art that was created in the 20th century and now in the early 21st century. The artists banded together to stand up to institutional powers, and that's a theme that reoccurs with the American Ashcan painters at the turn of the 20th century and later with the irascible abstract expressionists of the 1950s. Once again, here are some of our discussion points that you may want to browse before we get together and talk online.